If you have your Bibles, can you open to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready, Luke is the author, we got ready to leave at once for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi a Roman colony and the leading city in the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer, outside of the city gate to the river. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. We want to keep going in the chapter. If you take a quick look after, you will see, my Bible labels the next passage, Paul and Silas in prison. Because they're in Gentile country, I want to believe that the prison officials are Greek. They're in Greece, or Macedonia. And there are... Jews in this encounter. We know that Lydia was from Thyatira. So we have at least three cultures so far. Here she is from this town. So we have at least three cultures interacting. I want you to think about the founding of this church involving many cultural peoples. So I'm looking through that passage, verse 16. It happened that as we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us. And I'm not sure what culture she is from. She's a slave. Could be Greek. She brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. When her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans. So these Greeks slash Romans, her masters are Romans. She is probably Greek. Lydia is from Thyatira. We have these Jewish individuals. Okay, verse 22. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Perhaps the jailer was Roman too, we don't know. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. He called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. When he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. He rejoiced, believing God with all his household. A short period of time, a lot of action. Paul gets this vision, come over to Macedonia and help us. He goes on over there. On the Sabbath, he's looking for somewhere to worship, hoping maybe to find a Jewish congregation. The fact he has to go outside of the city walls and down by the river, 
some of you might know the account better than I do, suggest there was no synagogue, but there was a meeting place down by the river, and he saw a group of women. One of these women is a wealthy woman, Lydia, and I say she was wealthy, I don't know that for a fact, but she was a dealer in purple. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how it took thousands of these little snail-like creatures to produce one ounce of this purple dye, which they used to dye the clothing, and this was a labor-intensive process, so it was very expensive. So I want to believe that she had means. Here's the point I want to make, one of the points I want to make. Part of Paul's love affair with the newly established and then growing Philippian church is that they were extremely generous. They took care of Paul. It is great if as a missionary, you know that there's a home church that is going to financially support you whenever you have a need, either for yourself or for your mission. And Paul was very happy that he had someone he could count on. And the Philippian church was his go-to when he had a need. There are times that he had needs that he decided he was going to work with his hands. Down in Corinth, he tells them, look, I'm working with my hands. I don't want to be dependent on you. I want to show you that God will supply my needs. But there was always this idea that the Philippians had his back. They were going to take care of him. The theme some people say in the epistle is joy or rejoice. Joy and rejoice obviously come from the same root and there's a lot of joy he feels. There are lots of emotions. As we look at the first part of the chapter one, we're going to see different emotions being displayed. Imagine writing that love letter and even before you put pen to paper, the feelings are there. So the words that will come out will just be oozing and this is how Paul writes this letter. Some of you might have a different perspective on it, but that's how I feel and felt when I read Philippians. One of the passages that I was asked to memorize early as a junior soldier was Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 8. And it was from an interesting version. I can't remember, but it was not any of the versions that we had. But we had this little um, junior soldier book, and it said, in conclusion, fill your mind with those things that are good and worthy of praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Fill your minds with those things that are good and worthy of praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Let's get back to the joy. Let's get back to the lesson. Look at the title. I have you in my heart. This is where you get the sense it's a love letter. I have you in my heart. I got a text from my niece as we were coming down to church. My sister passed away one year ago, and she wrote me and says, I'm missing mom right now. I wish she were here. She felt her mother. She feels her mother right now in her heart because she's remembering that one year ago her mother passed. And for those of us who have experienced loss, on anniversaries or important occasions, or sometimes no occasion, we feel it in our heart. You have this person in your heart. When you're in love, too, you have the person in your heart. You want to see them so desperately. You have them in your heart. You're always carrying them around with you, so to speak. So even as he is in prison and he's thinking about this generous group of people who care for him and who he cares for deeply, he writes to say, I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart. The title of this week's session, I Have You in My Heart, causes the book of Philippians to sound like a love letter. It might cause one to wonder at the sort of experiences Paul had with the Philippians that he would write, I thank my God every time I remember you. And in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Paul is expressing strong feelings of gratitude, joy, longing, and love. It is a relationship built on experiences together. We've looked at Acts chapter 16 to see how the ministry evolved or devolved or started. The friendship between Paul and the Philippians was not just built off memories of the past. In this relationship, new stories were being written. Their friendship continued to grow because it was built around a mission. Paul described their relationship as one of being partners in the gospel. The reason Paul and the Philippians remained in each other's hearts was not just a sentimentality, 
for their past triumphs and, fit and trials, but because their journey together continued, even when apart. Part of what kept the ministry relationship ongoing was the fact that Paul continued to pray for the Philippians. For Paul, remembering his partners led to thanksgiving, and thanksgiving reminded him to pray for them. So we have this circle. I'm sure they prayed for him as well as they continued to send him financial gifts and other forms of support. So I was thinking on that theme, having you in my heart, and of course love songs come to mind, but I chose a song by Harry Anderson, a salvationist out of Ireland, and the chorus of that song says, I give my heart to thee, thy dwelling place to be, I want thee ever in my heart, O live thy life in me. Obviously he's referring to the Lord when he says this, but I want for us to think of interpersonal relationships as well. As a church, a Christian body, how we can care for each other and want each other in our hearts. As Paul says, I have you in my heart. I almost want to ask, do you have me in your heart? But I don't want to hear the answer in case it's <laughs> not what I want. I want to know that I have you in my heart. We're going to work through two passages from Philippians 1 and Philippians 4. Maybe we'll get to the Philippians 4 portion. There's not a lot here. Again, we are doing this for five weeks, so it's just context. You know me text without context. I think we have enough context as to the origin of the Philippian church. So let's get started. And after we pray, I'd like someone to volunteer to read the Philippians passages. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want you in our heart. We want to give ourselves so wholly to you that we feel this love affair. That we desire to be in your presence at all times. That our thoughts are thoughts that are true and noble and lovely and honorable. And that you are pleased with our lives. Help us, dear God, when we fail and fall short, to remember that your love is constant. You will always be gracious and forgiving to us. So may we accept that grace and that forgiveness and maintain our relationship with you in the way that pleases you and draws us closer to you. Help us as we break bread today to be encouraged and may our living be improved by our study today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so let's start at question number one. Based on the Acts account, what do we learn about Philippi and the genesis of the Philippian church? Okay, church. Founding fathers and mothers. Who are the people in chapter 16 of Acts? Okay, the women at the river, one of whom was... Lydia, who we say was probably wealthy. Her first act of generosity was to invite Paul and Silas and Luke to come and stay at her house. If you believe that I am indeed worthy, please come and stay at my house. And they took her up on the offer and she continued to support them. What else do we see in Acts chapter 16? Any other characters showing up in chapter 16? There's a slave girl. There is a Roman jailer. Any other characters showing up? Uh, just look at these three groupings of people. Well, let's think about their culture. The point I want to make here is that the origins of the Philippian church is very diverse. Can I say a motley crew? <laughs> From the rich to the poor, and others in between. And when they establish, they establish on a foundation that they're going to be generous to the one who came to help them. Remember, we don't know for a fact how it happened, but he got this vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And I wish I knew that there was someone who said that to him, but said it was a vision he had. Come over to, and a man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So, I want to say that the church was diverse, ethnically and economically, and it continued to establish a pattern of love and generosity. Certainly generosity towards Paul, but I want to believe that that generosity was more widespread. 
So we have the establishment of this church, and when Paul writes to them, he reminds them of his own feelings for them based on their own actions toward him and their generosity. There's a word that shows up in the passage, partnership, verse 6, verse 5, sorry. I'm going to read again the first passage. I start at verse 3. These are very short verses. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Imagine that. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Isn't that a great line? I thank God for all of you. In all my prayers, I pray with joy because of the partnership that you established from the very first day. Talk to me about this. What does this bring to your emotions or your mind? They were just as important to the ministry as Paul. They were involved in the ministry. They were partners. Mm -hmm. From day one. Partly because there's means. Certainly in Lydia's case. She said, come to my house. So she showed her own character as being a very generous person. And perhaps when you start something new, the founding culture is important. If you create a harmonious culture, people will join expecting that this culture will be maintained and supporting that culture. If you create a divisive culture, it's not going to go very far. But there's some organizations where you go in and you say, I don't want to be around this because it's so divisive. Others you get drawn to and you want to stay because the culture is harmonious. And I don't know if it was the women in the group that helped to cement the culture this way. We're told that he went down to the river and the women were there and he talked to the women. That's the first group we see being talked to. But the culture was established as a very generous and, I want to say, homey as opposed to homely. Homey culture. You're going to say something. Did you say homely? Homey. <laughs> I thought you said homely. I said homey as opposed to homely. I have spent 40 years in active ministry as a core officer, mostly as a core officer. And the culture of prayer in most of that ministry started with the women. Called the home lead. And and that, I appreciate that. I celebrate that in reflecting on a, a ministry of that focused in prayer. I tell you, without the women, it wouldn't have been a ministry for me. What did Ruth say? Some of my best men are women. We get the sense that these women were foundational. And I think that they brought something to that particular church that helped the church to establish itself so that many years later in jail, you can say from the very beginning. How does Chris? Well, I think it's very telling that, that, it, that it says that uh, they were believers in God already, that at least Lydia was. And because so many places where they went, they were not believers in God. Now remember he went down to the river expecting to find a congregation. Right. Probably because there was no synagogue in the city walls, he expected the Jews would congregate there. And all he found was women, and they were receptive. They, were, they went to worship. So he found where they worshipped, and he showed up, and he got involved. Any other thoughts? You probably can tell I haven't thought about this a lot, but I'm hoping that. So you have to ask that question about the culture, the originating culture. I think it's important. If you're going to start something, you've got to start it right. Otherwise, it's going to fizzle out. And sometimes we don't put the end vision in mind when we start something and that things fall apart because there's not a strong idea of, okay, this thing will survive and we're going to support it and nurture it. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. That's where the phrase comes up. It is right for me to feel this way about you, all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Where is Paul when he is writing this? He's in prison. Whether I'm in chains or defending the gospel, he's in prison. So I just look at that passage, verses 3 through 8. What feelings or emotions do you see expressed 
take a look at the paragraph. I think in a way he's reminiscing. I mean, he's in a bad place <laughs> with the people that he loves. That would be my first yeah. and, and yet with his group, he had confidence um, in that they would stay with the Lord. Faith in their faith? Surely that must mean Jesus first, yourself last. <laughs> I could <couldn't> resist. <laughs> Joy, reflection, and reminiscence. Love. Wow. Faith in their faith. Thankfulness. Anything else? Sort of like John Wesley, he saw the world as his parish. Mm -hmm. Give me a word. <laughs> International. <laughs> <laughs> the world for God. <laughs> That's more than one word. That's one word. <laughs> There's one more word I want you to pull out of this passage. I'll give you a hint. Verse 8. Longing. The longing. It says, I long for you with the affection of Christ. All right, let's look at our list and see if we can jump. So the feeling of emotions that I can't put it on. Have to do it yourself. I tell you, I believe this is a love letter. So I wanted to see if we can find the emotions that reflect his feelings, his sentiments as he writes. There's joy. The reflecting and the longing go together. One is looking back at what happened and looking forward to possibly being with them again. He's longing to be with them. He expects to be released from prison, and he does get released. So he's thinking about what they've done and thinking about, okay, you guys are so nice to me, I want to come back to be with you. Love. He believes in them, faith in their faith. He's thankful for all they've done for him. He is thinking of how they help him to continue his ministry. Wherever he is going to go, that he knows that the Philippines have his back. They're going to finance his ministry wherever he is going. They've offered that generosity. He says from the very first day when Lydia says, Come, you guys, you can stay at my house. She created that warmth and that openness that probably established the culture of that, I want to say, house church. But certainly it draws in people who understand that the foundation of this church is love and generosity and caring. It's a good partnership. Partnership. I want to write that word because that's the key of the session today, partnership. It's a little bit out of context, but that's the word I wanted to focus on, establishing the partnership. Question number five. In verse eight, Paul says he longs for them with the affection of Christ. If you have another translation or comment on that in your Bible, what does it say? What do you suppose Paul means by the phrase, the affection of Christ? Any other versions of that come to mind? Or any commentary? These are all things that Jesus is doing in heaven for us now. If we're partners, I've got Jesus up there saying all these things about me, and yet I'm not that really that good, but I kind of joined his party, and I get the benefits of Jesus saying, oh, I understand that problem, but I still love you, and I'm still thankful that you're with me, and, and I want you to keep on going. <laughs> My wife once commented, saying, somebody said, I might be a mess, but I'm Jesus' mess. <laughs> yeah. so. Let's go back to the origin. Remember, he was somewhere over here, and he had a vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. But it seems as though he went over there to be helped. <laughs> and his ministry for the next several years to be financed out of Philippi. Come over to help us. You help us, we help you. So no comment on the affection of Christ. What comes to my mind is the song that says, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. The affection of Christ, the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I think that's what he's saying. 
No comment? It says that the, the New Living Translation says tender compassion of Jesus Christ. Tender compassion. Tender compassion puts that affection in context <laughs> because it's tender. And compassion says it is deep longing to empathize with whatever you are going through. Tender compassion. Shall you, shall I meet Jesus by and by? You know the song I'm talking about? It has the, how tender his compassion. So, anyway, I had to do that. It comes to my mind. I have to tell it to you, otherwise I'll forget it. All right, let's keep going. Question number six. How should our love for Christ impact our relationship with others? Part B of the question says, what are some practical and tangible ways we can express our affection for fellow believers? Take whichever part of the question you want. How should our love for Christ impact our relationship with others? And what are some practical and tangible ways we can express our affection for others? Well, we should want nothing but the best for the people that we come in contact with. That's not easy, is it? Yeah, it depends. It's a stretch, it's a stretch goal. Because you want to keep wanting the best for them regardless of who they are. And sometimes you see them not trying very hard or just being wayward. And you have to say, I love you with the love of the Lord. Even a tough love. Well, you need to fall to rise again because sometimes people will not. They're more like goats than sheep. They're not willing to follow. But when someone comes into the congregation and you say, we're going to love you with the love of the Lord. You're going to love them through every crisis. You're going to love them through difficult situations that you don't necessarily understand if they're coming from a different cultural experience. So you have to be committed. It, it's the value. We value this. We will love you with the love of the Lord, and we're not going to hold it against you when you do something that is contrary. We're not going to force you out. We're going to continue to love you. So I want to underline that phrase in verse 8. The affection of Christ. But as Leslie say, it's a tender compassion. We long for each other with the tender compassion of Christ. What does that look like? How do we manifest that? How do you show me the affection of Christ? The tender compassion. Actions. With the Lord. Just when, just when you have a relationship with the Lord, you learn to stop and listen. And I think the term you were relating is that when someone says hello on the telephone, that's so telling. I mean, and if so, if you stop and listen, you can hear what's going on. And then you, it's, I feel it's an obligation to be supportive. But a lot of times we're so busy, we don't listen. We don't hear. We also don't want to know that something is going wrong. <laughs> so when people say, I'm fine, we are happy so we can move on. Yeah. I've thought of times when I could have talked to someone, but I kept thinking, this person has so many issues right now. If I... It drained me. I will spend a long time. And if I don't have the time... So I think of the parable Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. The priest didn't have any time. He had to get to the temple. The Levite didn't have any time. He had to get to the temple too. But at least he came over to make sure the guy wasn't dead, you know. And the Samaritan didn't have any time, but he didn't care. He dropped what he was doing and took care of things. We have to understand that sometimes when we feel we don't have any time, God is asking us, pleading with us, to make time. <laughs> We're busy, shockingly busy. So we don't make time. It's hard to make time. If we are talking about what you said, tender compassion. Tender compassion means that we have to be the good Samaritan. We have to stop. We have to ask questions. We have to have the person feel the way Paul felt about the Philippians. Gushing when you think about this person. Think of the people you feel this for right now and why you feel this. Sometimes you feel this way because people can do stuff for us. But that's not the right reason. That's the wrong motive. You want to feel this because... Is the affection of Christ. How Christ has affected you so that you act in a way that reflects how Jesus would act. And what is impressive to me is that from the very get-go, 
of these people were on board with Paul. And he loved them for it. And I'm sure that he gave back to them generously, although it's not transparent, but they certainly became his partners. And that was a fantastic thing. To find that partnership early. In an unexpected place, because remember, he, he, the Acts passage tells us he wanted to go north to Bithynia, and the Spirit prevented him from doing that. He wanted to go south, and the Spirit prevented him from doing that. So when you can't go over or under, <coughs> he went to Troas, he got a vision, and he found the people who would become his partners. There's a lesson there somewhere, and I don't exactly know what it is, but hopefully somebody who is smart and thinking can figure it out for me. Well, what we call that the providential leading of God, or she uses the term the hidden hand of God leading him. Yes, sir. Well, I've seldom been accused of being smart or whatever the other word you <laughs> what. But that's why I think that the lesson of, of the Samaritan story is not who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Yes, yes, it fits. In closing, I'll read verse 8 again. I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. May that be our prayer, that we would long for each other with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we develop tenderheartedness so that we long for each other with the affection of Christ. That in our living, others see us as reflecting Jesus. May our hearts be so encouraged that we do what is pleasing to you and that we seek to do what is pleasing to you. Help us, dear God, to stay on the course to be faithful in our giving and in our living, so others seeing us will give you the honor, the glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.